Hello there, members of the crime occult. It's Breland here. So I wanted to do something different in this video, and that is talk to you about some missing children's cases from all around the world. Let me know in the comments what you think happened to each child, because unfortunately, not a trace of them has ever been found. Remember to subscribe and become part of the occult. Don't forget to like the video and follow me on Instagram and TikTok. So let's get into it. The first missing child case we have here is the disappearance of Dennis Martin. Dennis Martin was born on June 20th, 1962. Dennis was only six years old at the time of his disappearance. Dennis and his family were from Knoxville, Tennessee. On June 13th, 1969, William Martin and his two sons, six-year-old Dennis and nine-year-old Douglas, were joined by William's father, Clyde, for what would be Dennis's first Father's Day weekend adventure. And he was so excited. It was a tradition for the Martin boys to get together and go camping in the Great Smoky Mountains. The boys were so excited to go on this camping trip. They had heard so many awesome things from their dad and grandfather about it and they just couldn't wait. Once they arrived to the campground, they unpacked all of their stuff, they cooked something to eat, on the campfire and really settled in to this exciting adventure. They started their adventure in Cades Cove and then set out on a 13 mile hike along Russell to Spencer Field Loop. After reaching Russell Field, they set up camp and had some dinner, went to bed because they had to get up early the next morning on June 14th to begin another 90 minute hike along the Appalachian Trail to Spence Field. So the next morning on June 14th, 1969, the boys got up early and set out on their trek to Spence Field. Once they arrived, they set up camp and had a late lunch around 4 p.m. Keep in mind there were other families in this campground. Dennis was even playing with some of the kids from this other family. At this point, the camp was set up, everyone was fed, and it was time to just relax and enjoy the scenery. Dennis, his brother, and a few of the other kids in the neighboring camps decided to play a sneak attack prank on the adults. Dennis's dad endearingly watched as his son snuck behind a bush and was going to hide there until the adults walked over and all the boys would jump out and surprise them. Dennis was wearing a bright red shirt, so the other boys told him to go off by himself and hide, and they went in another direction. So he went behind this bush, ready to jump out and surprise the adults, and he never came out. After his dad realized that Dennis wasn't popping out of the bush to surprise anyone. It had been maybe five minutes. He started to panic. So his dad frantically ran down the trail for about two miles until he realized there's no way he could have gone any further than this. Several hours go by and Dennis's father is just in a panic. So they go ahead and contact the National Forest Rangers to see what they could do to help and start some sort of search effort for his son. This area where Dennis disappeared is really dangerous for a little boy. There's lots of ravines, wild animals, steep slopes, snakes, bears, bobcats, and the worst predator of all, other human beings. To add insult to injury, just three hours after Dennis disappeared, an extreme downpour hit the campground and it rained three inches that evening. The rain caused flash flooding, it washed out trails, it also washed away any footprints or pieces of evidence that could lead them to Dennis. Extremely heavy downpours just plagued this campground during the first day of the search which is the most crucial time. Because of all this rain, after the first day of searching, there was 
an extremely heavy and thick mist that just set in throughout the campground. This just made the search even harder than it already was. Search efforts, including a separate search by the National Guard and Special Forces, found no trace of Dennis, not even a clue. Keep in mind, this wasn't some small search effort. This story had made headlines all across the area and there were 1,400 people who joined in the search efforts. So although there was a bunch of obstacles in the search, there were so many feet on the ground that Dennis's dad and grandfather had a lot more hope than they did in the beginning. A child's footprints were found in the mud around the search area. The child-sized footprints led to a stream where they disappeared. And the tracks indicated that one foot was barefoot while the other was in an Oxford, which is the type of shoe Dennis was wearing. A shoe and sock were also found. At first, they thought the footprints belonged to one of the children who was helping in the search effort. But later on, a former park ranger admitted that he thinks the footprints belong to Dennis because the prints displayed one foot with and without a shoe. And none of the kids who helped in the search efforts were barefoot, so it would only make sense that the prints belonged to Dennis. By June 22nd, 56 square miles of ground had been covered, and more than a thousand searchers continued to look until June 26th. The search was officially closed down on September 14th of 1969. As of 2021, this is still considered the largest search in the history of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. And unfortunately, Dennis Martin was never found. As of this year, 2022, Dennis Martin has been missing for 53 years. What do you think happened to Dennis? Let me know below. So this next story takes place in Ireland. This little girl's name was Mary Boyle and she was six years old. She, along with her twin sister Anne, were both born on June 14th of 1970. They also had an older brother named Patty Boyle. All of them were born in Spark Hill, Birmingham, England in the UK. Ironically, this story involves St. Patrick's Day. So on St. St. Patrick's Day, which was March 17th, 1977, Mary, along with her twin sister Anne, her mother Anne, her father Charlie, and her older brother Patty all got together and was planning to go over to their grandparents' house for St. Patrick's Day to celebrate and just spend some family time together. So Mary Boyle's grandparents lived on a rural farm out in the countryside and they lived in, I'm probably going to butcher this, Cashlard near Bali Shannon County, Dongol. So the kids were so excited to go and see their grandparents. They all got in the car, headed towards Grandma and Grandpa's house, and they arrived on March 17th, 1977. Mary and her family actually resided in another place, which was closer to the coast of Ireland. And this place was called, I am going to butcher this, so bear with me, Kin Kasla in the Rosses. Also, these grandparents of Mary's were her mother's parents, so they were her maternal grandparents. After they arrived to their grandparents house, all the kids were so giddy with excitement. I assume grandma had cooked some delicious Irish cookies, a beautiful Irish feast for St. Patrick's Day, and everybody was in great spirits. So like I said, they arrived on St. Patrick's Day, they spent the day together, and then they spent the night. And then the next day, on March 18th of 1977, 
is when Mary Boyle disappeared. Other parts of Mary's mother's family was there, so all the kids were getting together with their cousins and they were just all having a blast playing outside in this beautiful Irish countryside. I could only imagine how beautiful it was there, especially during the springtime. You know how Ireland is so green and just luscious? So Mary, along with her twin sister, older brother Patty, and two of her cousins were outside playing. And her uncle had expressed to her that he needed to go and return a ladder. He had borrowed this ladder from another person who had a farm and he needed to go and return it. So Mary said, hey, can I come with you? And he allowed her to come with him and they started walking towards this farm. This other farm was around 400 yards away, just across the hillside. So it wasn't that far, maybe 10 minutes at the most. So Mary happily trotted along with her uncle across several fields to this neighbor's house, and while doing so, she was eating a pack of sweets that her grandma had given her. Mary and her uncle were a little over halfway to this neighbor's farm when she decided to turn around and head back to her grandparents' house. Regardless, her uncle continued. It's said that it should have only taken her like five minutes tops to get back to her grandparents' farm, but unfortunately, she never made it back. Mary's uncle stated that he did make it to this neighbor's farm. He returned the ladder and decided to stay for about 30 minutes just to have a chat with them before heading back to his farm. Whatever happened during the time that Mary's uncle was there at the neighbor's farm and the time that she turned around and went back, nobody knows. So after some time had went by, the other kids along with Mary's parents and family members realized she was missing. Nobody had seen her and her uncle had already come back by that point and he said, wait, Mary's not here? I sent her back. She was supposed to be here with you. That's when everyone became pretty frantic. Everyone started to immediately search for Mary. They were even asking passers-by and other farmers in the area if they had seen Mary, what did they see. Once authorities were contacted and the town was alerted that Mary Boyle was missing, everyone began to take part in the search. Everyone was searching for her and very passionate about bringing Mary home. They even went as far as to drain multiple bogs in the area. They were thinking that if someone took Mary and, you know, did horrible things to her, they may have thrown her body into one of these bogs but they drained all of them in the area and found nothing. Mary's parents were devastated after weeks and weeks of searching, including her twin sister, Anne. In the end, Mary Boyle, nor the person responsible, was ever found. Let me know in the comments what you think happened to Mary Boyle. So this next missing child's case is the story of Marjorie West. Let's get into the details. So Marjorie West was born on June the 2nd, 1933 in Bradford, Pennsylvania, which is also where she resided at the time she went missing. Marjorie West was born to her parents, father Shirley West, mother Cecilia West, sister Dorothea, and brother Alan. All of this occurred in McKean County, Pennsylvania, and it's really sad to think that Marjorie was only four years old when she disappeared, so she was just a little baby. Let's get into the day she disappeared. So on May 8th, 1938, Marjorie, along with her parents, seven-year-old brother Alan and 11-year-old sister Dorothea, attended a church in Bradford, Pennsylvania. After they finished attending church, they decided to head on over to a picnic that was going on for Mother's Day. So the family all gathered together and 
and headed on over to this Mother's Day picnic in Marshburg, Pennsylvania. Marjorie's 11-year-old sister, Dorothea, had been put in charge of little four-year-old Marjorie while their mother had spoken to a few acquaintances at this picnic. So just imagine, let's set the scene. All the adults are mingling, there's children all around, and their mother says, hey, will you please watch your little sister so I can go and talk to so-and-so? 11-year-old Dorothea agreed to watch her four-year-old sister, and just for a split second, she had needed to speak to her mom about something. So she told Marjorie to stay put, stay where she was, and she walked over to her mother to speak to her about something. When Dorothea turned around and went back to where Marjorie was supposed to be standing, she was gone. Of course, her parents contacted the police and they started a search for her. The searches were conducted by 3,000 local people and 500 policemen. And they also interviewed motorists ranging from motorcyclists to car drivers, all within a 300 square mile radius. They used scent dogs to try and pick up her scent anywhere in the area. Nothing was found by the dogs. What's insane is there were so many people around that day and nobody saw what happened. The police commissioner had told newspapers that Marjorie really enjoyed playing the game hide and seek and they think she may have started one of these hide and seek games while her sister had walked away. But unfortunately, her sister wasn't the one who found her. The status of Marjorie West's missing child's case has been active for over 84 years. Marjorie West was never seen again. This missing child's case is from New Zealand, and it's the case of Kirsa Jensen. So let's get into all the details. Kirsa Jensen was born in Napier, I think is how you pronounce it, New Zealand, on December 15th of 1968. Kirsa was only 14 years old at the time of her disappearance. She absolutely loved horses, especially the horse that she would ride around all the time. His name was Commodore. So on the afternoon of September the 1st, 1983, Kirsa decided to saddle up Commodore and go for an afternoon ride. This was around 3 p.m. and she got on Commodore and started riding. She was actually headed towards a local beach to ride her horse on the beach, which really sounds like a dream. I've never done that before, but I've always wanted to. There's several witness accounts of different people in town seeing Kirsa even after she had ridden her horse. Later on that afternoon, her horse was found wandering along the local river. I'm not even going to try to say it, but I'll put it on the screen. This case is one of the very few unsolved, unaliving cases in New Zealand history, and a lot of New Zealanders actually know about this. I've personally never heard about it, but of course I'm not from New Zealand. So once Kirsa failed to return home by 5.30 p.m., her family began to call for her, search for her, ask around to see where she may be. Shortly afterwards, they alerted police. Continued searches by police and volunteers over the following days, including through the local river and other waterways, failed to turn up any signs of Kirsa. Now let's talk about the witnesses who saw Kirsa on that day. One of the most important pieces of information was from a passerby who noticed a girl fitting Kirsa's description next to this gun emplacement, which was right next to the beach. And she was being held at arm's length by a European man. This guy looked to be about 45 to 50 years in age, and he was white. The same witness also said a white utility vehicle with brown sides was parked close by. Another witness stopped to talk to Kirsa at this gun emplacement and noticed that she had a completely bloodied face. She told him that she actually fell from her horse and there was someone who had gone to collect her parents and she was expecting them to return any moment. 
A third witness said around 4.30 in the afternoon, he had driven past this white utility vehicle coming off the bridge. And the driver was described as brown-haired, white male, approximately 20 to 30 years old. And his arm was actually around this girl passenger's shoulders, and he was driving using the other hand. Later on, Kearse's horse Commodore was seen by several witnesses after this tied to the gun emplacement. Unfortunately, these witness accounts turned up no leads. After several years of investigating Kearse's disappearance, the police did have a suspect, and his name was John Russell. John Russell already had a conviction for essaying someone. He even identified himself as the man who was seen with Kearse at the gun emplacement that day. The police actually investigated his house and his truck, but no evidence was found that Kirsa was even there. So in 1985, John Russell actually admitted and confessed to slaughtering Kirsa Jensen. Then he later retracted his confession. No charges were ever pressed against John Russell, and unfortunately, we would never know if he really was the one who took Kirsa's life because in 1992, he took his own life. Although there were several pieces of evidence along with witness accounts, Kirsa Jensen, her body, nor the person responsible for her going missing has ever been found. Lastly, here's my opinion on what I think happened to each one of these children. Regarding Dennis Martin, I think Dennis got lost. I believe he got so turned around and he just kept running trying to find his way back to camp. And eventually he passed away, possibly from starvation, maybe even being attacked by an animal. Regarding Mary Boyle, I do in fact think somebody abducted her as she was walking back to the farm. And not only that, I think maybe even her uncle had something to do with it. I also don't think she fell into a bog and drowned. For Marjorie West, I think she was definitely abducted by a predator that was scouring the area for moms who had turned away from their kids. Because if you think about it, that's the perfect place to look for someone with children. A Mother's Day picnic. Obviously, mothers have children. They're going to bring their children to this function. So predators maybe heard about it and scoured the area for children who maybe their mom had just looked away for a second and they could snatch a child. Marjorie was perfect. She was left alone and she possibly went off to hide and wait for her sister to come find her. But unfortunately, a disgusting predator found her first. As far as Kirsa Jensen goes, I do believe she maybe fell off her horse and she was like a damsel in distress. She needed someone to help her get back to her parents because she was injured. I think a disgusting predator took advantage of Kirsa in her vulnerable state. So that's my opinion on all these stories. Let me know in the comments which one you thought to be the most fascinating and let me know what you think happened to each child. Please Please, please watch your kids closely because you never know who's watching your kids besides you. So I thank you very much for watching. Please like the video if you want to see more and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!